Thank you very much, Kathleen. Uh, and thank you all for coming this afternoon. Um, I've had a lovely time this morning at the Padua Academy first, learning about that particular institution and talking to the students there, and then learning more about the activities of the Lahore, of the Delaware Lahore Delhi Partnership for Peace. That is a mouthful, uh, but obviously a group that's doing a lot of good work, and uh, it sounds like you're going to have a wonderful trip to Lahore in January, and I know our people there will look forward to receiving you. Um, I'm going to say a few words about myself and then to give you a perspective from where I sit of how we view Pakistan and its neighbors. I know there are a lot of South Asians in the audience here, so you know a lot about the region, but sometimes it's helpful to see how, how we view it uh, from, from Washington and our policymaking perspective. Um, I first went to um, Pakistan in 1975, uh, driving from Germany. I had a little orange Vega, uh, drove through Iran where I'd been a lecturer at a women's college there, through Turkey and so on, across the Khyber Pass into Peshawar where I was greeted by our consul general there who had a beautiful old colonial residence. His wife was a landscape gardener. Uh, this house was beautiful. Uh, and Peshawar was a sleepy old town. Uh, lots of tongas, uh, marvelous uh, bazaar market, and all sorts of things. It was a very, very appealing place. I had an old hotel called Dean's, which was very reminiscent of the colonial period and so on. And that was my first introduction uh, to Pakistan. And in, the, and in those days, South Asia in the State Department, where I work, was really kind of off the, off the charts. It was, you know, halfway around the world, and there wasn't a whole lot of interest. There were people who were devotees of Indian culture and history and so on, much more so than Pakistan at, at those times. But there just wasn't a whole lot of, of policy interest. But Pakistan also, in those days, was very quiet and calm. Um, I traveled all over the country, north to south, mountains to desert, and so on, and had a fabulous time. And, and of course, some of the people I met then um, are people who are now <laughs> uh, in positions of, uh, of uh, authority if they're not retired. Um, but many of them are not, and they're very active in their communities, either in business or politics or whatever. Uh, anyway, all by way of saying, I really like Pakistan, you know, uh, the, um, a, a lot of fond memories of my associations there over the years. I like Pakistanis, I like all South Asians. They're hospitable, they're warm, they're friendly, and so on. So some of the perspective I offer uh, may suggest that uh, Pakistan's a hard country to love, but I <laughs> want to assure you up front that I, in fact, do. So let me go through the way we think about Pakistan and the State Department. First of all, why is it important? Um, you know, maybe the answer to that's obvious, but from what you read in the paper sometimes you, you wonder. It's important uh, in part because it's big. Uh, 180 million people, uh, some people say actually it's at least 200 million. They haven't had a census for a long time. President Zardari used to always say 200 million easily. He's probably right. Um, anyway, so it's a big country, uh, fifth most populous in the world, has a large uh, English-speaking labor force. It has a strategic location, um, borders Afghanistan, India, China, Iran. Um, a difficult part of the world, and as Pakistanis often say to us when we say, you know, really did you have to do this or did you have to do that or can't you, you know, be nicer to your neighbors, they look at us and say, you know, we don't live between Canada and two oceans and Mexico, you know, like, <laughs> this is a lot more difficult neighborhood than you all live in. Um, they have the seventh largest army in the world. Um, some people think this is good, some people think this isn't so good, uh, but they've actually been of great help to us um, currently on the Afghan border, there are 140,000 troops, and they do help us a lot there. 
Um, they've been very active over the years in peacekeeping, very effective peacekeeping troops. Um, and for better or for worse, they are the strongest and I would say the most respected institution in the country. Not everybody likes them, but they are well respected and uh, quite disciplined. Uh, Pakistan's a Muslim democracy. Um, it has a constitution, which is, you know, a good constitution by any standard. Uh, and it has been and can be a force for modernity and moderation in the Muslim world. And, and this is very important to us as we look at the region. Uh, and finally, Pakistan has nuclear weapons. We didn't think this was such a good idea and we tried very hard over the years to both discourage them and to get in the way of their effort <laughs> to, um, to develop a nuclear capability, but uh, we failed. They tested a nuclear weapon after India did. And so that comes into our calculation of why they're an important country. So Pakistan's important, but they get um, a lot of negative press. Uh, I, I was um, uh, talking to my friend here who's headed out to Lahore, who was asking me difficult questions about Pakistan, you know, uh, and the, the negative image that gets portrayed. So what's, and some people will say Pakistan's the most dangerous country in the world. I don't happen to believe that's true, but you certainly see that uh, at times in the press. So why is that? Um, Terrorism and violence, no doubt. This was the home of Osama bin Laden for a number of years. Uh, that represents Al-Qaeda. Pakistan also has uh, part of the Afghan Taliban leadership living inside the borders of Pakistan. They live along the border in the tribal areas that's not the best regulated place in the country, but they, they are there. Um, Pakistan also has its own Pakistani Taliban, uh, which has been since uh, the middle of the 2000s from, well, they were established in 2007, but before that, they've been directly attacking the Pakistani state. Uh, military installations, schools, you name it, all kinds of institutions, they even uh, bombed uh, the mosque outside the military headquarters in Rawalpindi. So um, uh, this, this is a real challenge. So you've, you've got some Al-Qaeda elements, you've got uh, the Afghan Taliban, you've got the Pakistani Taliban, then you've got other groups um, such as the Lashkar al Taiba L-E-T, which is a group that uh, was responsible for the uh, attacks in Mumbai, India in 2008. And then you've got sort of random killing in Karachi and Sunni sh Shia sectarian violence. So there's, you know, you can understand with the violence and terrorism how uh, Pakistan can get a negative image. Pakistan's economy is also in sort of a fragile state. Um, What's, they've really gotten behind the eight ball in the last decade or so in terms of the energy sector. So there are blackouts, um, rolling blackouts in the country in the summertime, sometimes in some areas as much as 12, 16, even 18 hours a day. Um, and that's really, um, you know, puts a damper on things. It not only makes people restless, but it also is a real blow to manufacturing and industry and so on. So it's hard on the economy. Uh, Pakistan hasn't managed its balance of payments all that well, so they're under constant pressure. They just had to do a deal with the IMF for $6.7 billion. Um, and they, you know, they're just really behind the eight ball. There's a lot of reform that they need to do to get back on the right track. Uh, like many countries in the region, uh, they have a really high unemployment rate. They just aren't producing enough jobs for people that enter the labor market every day. Uh, and in recent years, both domestic and particularly foreign investment has really collapsed in large part because of the security and you know, people are nervous to invest. So uh, the slow growth in the economy has wow. created a dependency on foreign donors and foreign sources of, uh, of capital. Um, 
So economy in crisis, they also have had poor governance. Uh, this hasn't always been the case, but at the moment, very poor service delivery, look at the energy sector, um, uh, very poor delivery of education and health services, you look at uh, human development indicators, uh, literacy rate 55 percent, um, much lower among women, uh, worse than, for example, Bangladesh, the former East Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan's also disaster prone. We saw uh, photographs this morning in the slideshow put together by one of the schools of the floods of August 2010, uh, which were really devastating. Um, t close to 20 million people were affected one way or the other. Uh, uh, if you looked at a map um, or f overflew the areas I and colleagues did, it was just water everywhere. The whole Indus Valley, water just everywhere. Um, and then in 2005, they had an earthquake in the north that killed 85,000 people in five minutes. Uh, I would say um, in both of these disasters, uh, we and the U.S. military, who happened to be in the neighborhood, were very active in helping with the relief supplies. We had helicopters, we had C-130s coming from Afghanistan, bringing in supplies constantly uh, for about a month. Uh, in both of these disasters, but you know, it's a, uh, it's got a river system, it has floods, it's got mountains, it has earthquakes, and so it just tends to um, be prone to these disasters. And then finally, it's it's got the neighborhood I was talking about. You've got Afghanistan on one side, the war going on there, Pakistan not always uh, playing straight on that side or on India, it's got a longish history of what we call proxies, um, proxy warfare. I will say they're not the only ones that have done that in history, but uh, they've been very <laughs> active in that regard and um, it, it increases the instability in the region and it increases the negative image of the country, I would say. But if you look back at Pakistan's history, you realize it hasn't always been this way. 1947, at partition, Pakistan was on a par with all the countries in the region, India, Bangladesh, they were all of a piece and all on par, and incidentally way ahead of Korea, Thailand, Philippines, all the Asian tigers that later took off and surpassed South Asia. At the time, Pakistan, India, and all were way ahead of them. So they had reasonable human development indicators. They had a very capable civil service, thanks to the British. Um, they had an effective military. They had a local government system, maybe not what everybody would choose, but the political agent system set up by the British at least uh, was a workable system. And they had a huge investment in agriculture, the largest irrigation system in the world. Um, which they still have, but which is in need of a lot of repair because maintenance has not been their strong suit either. Um, but in 1947, it was, it was looking okay. Um, they also had a vision for a pluralistic and progressive state of Muhammad Ali Jinnah. Um, those of you who have studied this period, I know, uh, have read these words often, um, citizens of all faiths will be treated equally, Jinnah said in a famous speech, August 11th, 1947, you are free to go to your temples, your mosques, or any other place of worship. Pakistan started out as a dominion under the British crown. Um, it didn't become an Islamic Republic until 1956. And Sharia law, which again, justifiably in some ways has a bad reputation, didn't come in until the late 70s under uh, General Zia. Uh, so again, uh, 60 odd years ago, uh, the country was seemed to be on a good wicket. Um, they, in the 50s and 60s, were a model developing country. They had a planning commission that was set up and Harvard University came and helped them uh, develop their five-year economic plans and so on and so forth. They had high growth rates. Green Revolution started in the University of Faisalabad. Um, there was an American professor there who hoped, helped that along, uh, researcher Norman Borlaug. 
Um, this is my favorite part for any of you who've flown Pakistan International Airways recently. This was the model airline. And it was PIA that helped Qatar Airways. Has anybody flown Qatar or Emirates? Really nice. We look for them to have partnerships with American Airlines so we can fly them when we have to fly America. Because <laughs> they're fabulous airlines. PIA gave them their start. Uh, and there was amazing infrastructure constructed then. Tarbela Dam, one of my favorites, because uh, when I was first in Pakistan, I went to this site. And um, it, it was still under construction, largest earth-filled dam in the world. And we went down uh, to one of the tunnels, which hadn't been opened up yet. So there's this big steel wall. And it's, it was fascinating. I'll never forget. I'll never forget the picture, because I was just imagining trillions of cubic feet of water right behind that wall. And I was standing, hoping that nothing would happen to this uh, steel structure. Uh, but you know, a generation of Pakistani engineers trained with Americans and others to build that, Mongla Dam, so on. Uh, Pakistan had really good relations with the United States at that point. We were allies. It was the Cold War. Um, we and Pakistan were allies. India was more in the Soviet camp. Although it called itself not aligned, it was, <laughs> it was more on the Soviet side. Uh, and it was Peshawar, uh, the capital of the frontier, now KP province, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, where uh, Secretary of State Kissinger secretly flew to uh, do the opening to China when Nixon was president. We had an air base there in Peshawar. And so that was how intimate we were and how um, I also mentioned this morning that in that period in the early 60s, uh, Jacqueline Kennedy, wife of President Kennedy, and her sister went on a visit to India and Pakistan. And <laughs> she actually went up to the Khyber Pass, which is now sort of no man's land, dressed in a, in a, a straight silk sheath dress, sleeveless, uh, with a pillbox hat. I mean, these were totally different days, and I'm, I'm grateful for all the photographs uh, that remind us that this actually happened, because it's quite a bit different now. So what happened? You have this in the late 40s after partition and independence, and you have uh, a rather more negative picture now. Uh, a number of things happened. First of all, and I think this is important, not everybody uh, cites this, but I think it is important. Jinnah, who was behind, um, it's a complicated history, but supported a separate state for Muslims. Uh, but he was a progressive guy, um, and he had a, a liberal inclusive vision for the state of Pakistan. He died shortly, you know, he was, he was terminally ill uh, as the celebrations were going on at, uh, at independence. So he died, uh, unlike in India, where Nehru, his opposite number, uh, lived for another 20 years and, and was a very strong leader, you know, setting the stage for Indian democracy and political family and so on. That didn't happen in Pakistan. And so uh, they lost Jinnah, and then they got into this military coups, civilian, military, civilian. So half the time, Pakistan's been ruled by a military government. And the problem there is not so much that military people are evil or dictators or anything else. It's just that civilian institutions and democratic institutions don't take root when you have the military running the show. They make the trains run on time and they, they can do a lot of things. And as I say, the Pakistani military is very disciplined. But um, it doesn't allow civilian institutions to put down roots, to evolve and grow. And that's a big part of Pakistan's problem. Um, because all this was going on, they never modernized or reformed their economy. So that's why they've got part of the problems they have today. They didn't do land reform. Uh, the agricultural system is still dominated by feudals. Um, smallish, relatively number of families own a lot of the land. 
uh, and it really inhibits uh, modern techniques and inclusion and all, all the rest. India, for the most part, undertook uh, land reform. Not totally, but they, they did, and they did it when it was a lot easier. The longer you wait, the harder it gets. Secondly, um, Pakistan's economy is, to a large degree, still statist. They have a lot of state-owned enterprises. Um, PIA is one, and it has, Pakistan International Airlines has something like 27 or 28 people on the ground for every aircraft, whereas modern airlines have four or something like that. Those numbers might not exactly be right, but it's, uh, the state-owned enterprises become um, an object of patronage and inefficiency. And it's the same with the steel mills and cement factories and so on. So there's a, there's a issue there of inefficiency inherent in the economy. They also subsidize a lot of things. They subsidize fuel. They subsidize food. Now, they're not the only ones who do that. Other countries do that as well. But the subsidies bill, particularly in the power sector, is huge. And part of the problem is they don't target their subsidies. Everybody gets the same subsidy, whether you're rich or poor. And it's a huge drain on the treasury. Also in Pakistan, there's a very low tax pace. People don't like to pay taxes. And so um, the revenue collection is only about eight or nine percent of the gross national product. In order to run a modern state, um, it's got to be, I'm told by economists, sort of 18, 19, even 20 percent. So they don't have enough money you know, to run, um, run the country. Uh, another stress for Pakistan is that when all the other countries in the neighborhood were getting on with family planning, child spacing and all that sort of thing in the 80s and 90s and so on, uh, and 70s. After the late 70s, when the Soviets invaded Afghanistan and the sort of conservatism, Islamic conservatism began to seep around the world, the family planning programs of which we and others and international organizations had been involved in sort of evaporated. So you have today three times as many people in Pakistan as when I first went there in 1975. And it's everywhere apparent. There's pressure on every system, transportation, health, schools, and all of that. Uh, because there are too many people, because they didn't um, take advantage of the period that everybody else did in, in better services, health, education, uh, and making family planning services available. And uh, you know, everybody who's in the family planning business, just to uh, make sure people understand, will tell you that the statistics show there's huge unmet demand for family planning services. It's not that you even need to create the demand. The demand is there. You just need to get the services out to people. So that's a problem. And of course, in, um, since independence, there's been a huge distraction in Pakistan um, and in India with the military competition between India and Pakistan. And Pakistan, because the military was in charge half the time, it became more assertive, got more of the resources, uh, and uh, therefore made it more difficult for revenues to be spent on other things. Now, I've, I've mentioned India a few times. Um, and let me just uh, describe how we see this, the issue with India for Pakistan. Why do India and Pakistan not just get along? Um, first reason, I think, is, is history. The partition, uh, the splitting of India and Pakistan when the British were leaving, turned out to be very, very bloody. Uh, when you read the history, much bloodier than anybody expected, certainly uh, than the British who had devised the system um, expected. And uh, there's still a bitter taste. I mean, and I'm sure it will fade a bit as the generations go on, but people still remember that period. Um, there's a uh, disagreement, um, shall we say, over the state of Kashmir. This was a Muslim majority state with a Hindu ruler. Um, and it 
went to India because that's what the Hindu ruler decided to do, but Pakistan never fully accepted that. Uh, you know, so this has been a source of uh, dis disagreement and tension since partition. Um, East and West Pakistan, as you know, East Pakistan is now Bangladesh. It split from the West um, in a civil war in 1972 and 71-72. India actively helped East Bangladesh split from the West, so Pakistan still resents the fact that India helped separate the two countries. Uh, when you look at a map, you wonder actually how they would have stayed together over the longer term because they weren't connected by land at all. India was in between, so in many ways it didn't make a lot of sense, but they were doing it according to population and that was a very <coughs> majority um, Muslim area, so they made it part of Pakistan. Uh, anyway, it's still a, a source of uh, <laughs> bitterness from that period. And then later, Pakistan supported the insurgency in Kashmir. Uh, the Indians had mismanaged Kashmir rather uh, uh, badly and fixed elections and that kind of thing. Kashmiris got upset with that. There was an insurgency and the Pakistanis piled on, you know, infiltrating people to uh, help the insurgents, which naturally made the Indians mad. Uh, and then, of course, you have a competition between India and Pakistan in the nuclear field. Um, India decided it needed a nuclear weapon because China had a nuclear weapon, then Pakistan decided it needed nuclear weapons because India had them. So now they both have them, um, and it's a, it's a source of, of tension and, um, you know, uh, concern. Uh, because of the other underlying uh, tensions between the two countries because you don't want uh, them to have a war for fear they might use nuclear weapons. And then finally today, in the last decade, Pakistan has resented India because India has gotten closer to the United States because after the fall of the Soviet Union, India woke up in our view, reformed its economy, um, became more open to the rest of the world and they're a big modernizing state and it was only natural to the United States since they, since the Soviet Union had disappeared uh, that we would have a relationship with India. So that has made uh, Pakistan a bit envious. So those are some of the issues um, between uh, India and uh, Pakistan. Um, and then we have w what's happened to Pakistan as a result of the war in Afghanistan. And this, I mentioned that there were many more secular attitudes and streams in Pakistan at partition. And part of what happened to change that today is uh, the Soviet invasion, invasion of Afghanistan. And this really, since we were supporting uh, quietly the Mujahideen who were fighting against the Soviets, uh, we were funneling a lot of our support through Pakistan because that was a natural route. Uh, and the whole effect of this war was that the jihadist mentality sort of caught on and as I mentioned, um, uh, the more conservative Islam didn't come in until uh, uh, General Zia took over. Um, and that was in the same period. So this conservatism was kind of seeping around and there were madrasas and uh, new laws, very strict laws against blasphemy and adultery and all this kind of stuff. And this war also empowered uh, the military more than it had been before because a lot of money, our money that was coming in to help support the Mujahideen, of course, went through the military because they were the ones who were, uh, were passing the uh, ammunition and money along. Uh, so uh, Pakistan became dependent uh, on this stream of funding and on assistance and came to sort of expect it. And then, boom, the Cold War ends, the Russians leave Afghanistan, and we, mistakenly, and we paid for this later, uh, said, oh, well, the Russians are gone, we're gonna concentrate on uh, our own country, and 
rebuilding our own infrastructure and uh, Secretary Warren Christopher, I remember saying in 1992, I sit behind the America's desk. He was trying to suggest that now we would focus um, our foreign policy more in terms of our own interests and not so much um, in terms of fighting wars in foreign places. Um, but the result of that vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan was that we no longer had this immediate need uh, for their help in Afghanistan. So we let sanctions fall on, on the state of Pakistan, the so-called Pressler sanctions, which we, we'd been holding off all through the period of the uh, war in Afghanistan uh, because we didn't want to sanction the country that was helping us. But these were sanctions uh, related to their nuclear program. So they were, as soon as, soon as we left, after they'd helped us with Afghanistan, we put the sanctions on. Uh, so this, um, and then 10 years later, we flipped the other way. 9-11 happened. Uh, we went to Pakistan and said, we need your help. Um, all is pretty much forgiven. Uh, sanctions were eased and um, we got back into the business of uh, using Pakistan to help us in Afghanistan. And so this is, you know, has had a certain effect on Pakistan uh, that's hard to deny. Now the issue between Pakistan and Afghanistan, quickly. Um, Pakistan is nervous because Afghanistan does not accept its border with Pakistan, the border that the British drew, called the Durand Line. Uh, Afghanistan thinks that it should, you know, that Peshawar is an Afghan city and that uh, the Pakistani Pashtuns and the Afghan Pashtuns should all be together in one state, which would be Afghanistan. So this makes Pakistanis nervous. They don't, they're not active at the moment on this, but that is their position. They do not officially accept that border. Uh, Pakistanis also worry about Indian influence in Afghanistan. They feel they're squeezed with Indians in the West and Indians in the East. Um, the Pakistanis resent the close relationship we've developed with President Karzai and the Afghans. Because Pakistanis, to be honest, have often felt a bit superior to the Afghans. And they thought, particularly during the 80s, that they could manage the Afghans. They had the money. They pulled the strings. Uh, so when we're now so close to the Afghans, that makes them nervous. The Afghans, on the other hand, resent the patronizing attitude of the Pakistanis. Um, and see them as supporters of the Taliban, uh, you know, as patronizing, uh, oppressive, and so on. And they worry about the fact that Pakistan stands between them and access to the rest of the world in terms of a port. Uh, they're a landlocked country, and so they feel very nervous about Pakistan blocking uh, access to trade for them. So there are these natural tensions built into that relationship. So what does all this mean for the United States? Um, for the reasons I described at the outset, we need a workable, um, friendly, practical relationship with Pakistan. It's an important country to us. We want Pakistan to be stable, to have prosperity so they're not dependent on us and others for aid. Uh, we'd like, ideally, to have a low maintenance relationship. And I say that because there's a lot of emotion in the relationship between Pakistan and the United States. There's been a lot of drama from uh, the aftermath of Osama bin Laden. Uh, that same year, 2011, started off with a, with a CIA contractor shooting down two people in Lahore. Um, people weren't pleased about that. Um, and then finally there was an unfortunate incident on the border where we accidentally killed 24 Pakistani soldiers and that was the straw that broke the camel's back. So for the next seven months there was great um, drama in our relationship and Pakistan closed the border uh, between Pakistan and Afghanistan. So we had to start sending all of our 
uh, material for the war in Afghanistan through the North, which was much more expensive and um, very inconvenient and took a lot of work. So uh, we would like to have a no drama relationship. We want help on counterterrorism for the obvious reasons. We need help from Pakistan on uh, the whole issue of reconciliation in Afghanistan. Eventually there has to be a political settlement in Afghanistan. Nobody's going to win militarily. Uh, and the Pakistanis have influence. They have influence on the Afghans that uh, are living in Pakistan. They have influence dating back from the 80s. So we want them to use that uh, to good effect. Uh, we want them to take what we would say is a more responsible approach, no more proxies in India or Afghanistan, get along with your neighbors, don't um, uh, risk some kind of uh, conflagration in the region um, by picking fights with your neighbors. And finally, we want their nuclear weapons to be safe. Um, this is uh, uh, something of concern uh, to us and you know, everyone else in the world as well. What they want, if we listen, is first and foremost respect for their sovereignty and they see a lot of what we've done in the last decade related to the war in Afghanistan as, um, you know, as uh, a breach of their sovereignty. They want recognition of their sacrifice in the war on terror. Uh, they often remind us that 40,000 people have, have been killed and you know, close to 5,000 of those military forces, i.e. more than we've lost in Afghanistan, um, have been killed in Pakistan. So they would like a little respect for that and I think that's perfectly reasonable. They want us to be uh, responsible as we draw down from Afghanistan because they're worried that we might not be and the effects for them in the early 90s uh, after the Russians had left Afghanistan and we walked away and put sanctions on them and all the rest and, and abandoned, really we did, Afghanistan so that it became uh, you know, fertile ground for the Taliban and Al-Qaeda and everybody else, they don't want a repeat of that. Um, they want compensation, they want us to pay for the costs incurred of their army being deployed on the, on the western border with Afghanistan. It's very expensive, the operations they undertake, um, and we've, we've done that. They want more access to the U.S. market. Um, they talk about trade rather than aid. I think no country enjoys being dependent on you know, the kindness and generosity of others. People want to be self-sufficient and from their point of view, part of would, what would help them is more access to the market here. And finally, they want the status of having a strategic relationship with the, with the United States. Um, they don't want to be just called into service when we need them and then cast aside. That's from, from their perspective. So when you look at this uh, from, from our perspective, uh, it doesn't seem unreasonable. What they want, what we want, it doesn't seem unreasonable and it's, it's perfectly clear when you look at both sides that we share a lot of common interests. We both want stability in Afghanistan, an end to violence, uh, regional trade, economic and social progress, constitutional democracy. Or these are all uh, goals that we share for ourselves and the other. And it's perfectly clear to me when I look at members of the diaspora, the community here and elsewhere, um, that Pakistani Americans, Pakistanis who've come to this country, are hugely successful and they thrive in this environment and this is the kind of environment they like the same way we like and the same way their, their um, uh, fellow countrymen in, in Pakistan would like to live. So we, we have many of the same values and same goals. So what do we need to do? Um, first thing we need to do is take the emotion out of the mix. The Pakistanis often say to me, well you know how we are, we're so emotional. True. 
but we have been very emotional in recent years because the stakes are so high for us. We're very quick uh, to want to cast blame because we have troops and lives on the line in Afghanistan and it really does make it hard for us to stay objective. Um, we need to engage more with the civilian government. We, in the last decade, every congressional delegation that goes to Pakistan, the first place they want to go is to go see the chief of army staff because he's perceived to be the most powerful guy in the country and that he's the one who controls the policies in Afghanistan which are of such importance to us and so on and so forth. But when you do that, you contribute towards the disempowerment of the civilian side when in fact you want to do the opposite. So we need to uh, do that. We need to encourage um, economic self-reliance. It's something the Pakistanis want themselves. Uh, but we get um, uh, very heavily involved. We have a huge assistance program and that becomes an institution in and of itself. So we need to really listen and encourage more uh, public-private partnerships, investment, and that sort of thing, rather than traditional donor assistance. And in that sense, we need to listen um, and focus on Pakistan's priorities. Right now, what Pakistan and Pakistani public are most, most concerned about is electricity. You know, as much as they like education and health care and so on and so forth, electricity is the top priority. So we need to uh, make sure that we're responding to that. Uh, we need to be predictable. We need to be seen to be fair. Um, and that's sometimes, again, when the stakes are high and we have a lot um, at stake and are taking risks nearby as we are in Afghanistan, that can be hard to do. We can be unpredictable um, and arbitrary and we need to kind of uh, work on that. And finally we need to continue and expand our people-to-people -people programs. We have the largest Fulbright program in the world in Pakistan. We need to keep that up. It's a big country. It can absorb uh, that kind of program. We need to keep up our military uh, training, international military education and training. I met hugely successful program for decades. We missed out a whole generation of Pakistani officers who in the 90s didn't come to American schools and this was a huge mistake because they don't know us uh, and it, it makes an enormous difference. Um, and we, we're back to that now and we need to keep it up. And we need to encourage all of the diaspora contacts, um, use these big diaspora organizations to keep connected with Pakistan. And groups like your group, you know, these even individuals or small groups can have a huge effect on the people that they meet. Uh, and in convincing people that we're not the ogres we're sometimes portrayed as in the Pakistani press. And I'm happy to say that uh, things are changing on both sides, on the Pakistani side and on the American side. We're, we're learning on both sides. For Pakistan, they had an election uh, in May. And what was important about this election was that it was the first time uh, that a civilian government had completed its term, five-year term, in the parliamentary system. Um, and the previous government, and I don't want to say anything uh, too negative about them, but <laughs> they weren't good at governance. This was the People Party, People's Party. They were not really good at governance, but they were good at politics. And this was hugely important because the leadership of uh, the People's Party, and I'm looking at you because I know you're a <laughs> member of that party, uh, managed to keep a coalition together. And they didn't have the numbers in their own party in the parliament. You know how parliamentary systems work. You need to keep a coalition or your government falls. So he managed, um, Asif Sardari, who was president, who was the widower of Benazir Bhutto, a very well-known politician, uh, he managed to keep the government together. And that was a huge accomplishment. And of course, he, you know, his party got 
trounced in the election because they were no good at governance. But the, the uh, important thing is they got the country to that point. So you've got a new government. Um, this is the third time for the prime minister in office. Would have been the third time for Benazir Bhutto had she uh, lived because I'm sure that uh, the party would have won. Uh, in any case, um, but so you've, you're, you're able to turn over a new page with a new prime minister. Uh, and it, it doesn't mean that this party's values are so much different or anything, but they're able to turn over a new page. They're focusing very heavily on the economy, on energy reform, uh, economic growth. Uh, they were able, against all odds, to negotiate an IMF agreement with an IMF that was very skeptical of Pakistan because the last agreement they have fell apart. They managed to do it. Um, they've got a new energy reform plan. Uh, they are the party of the industrialists as opposed to the feudals, <laughs> the agriculturalists. Uh, so they're very keen on business and, uh, and the private sector and entrepreneurs and, and all of that sort of stuff. So this is, this is a good, healthy focus. Um, and you see, not just because of the election, but you can see as you look more closely at Pakistan that the, um, the country really is very resilient economically. Uh, entrepreneurs are very successful. It's interesting, Harvard Business School has this um, um, the 100 best entrepreneurs program in a number of countries and the Harvard Business School woman in charge of this told me she'd never seen entrepreneurs like these young uh, people from Pakistan. They're, you know, they just managed to find a way forward. Very enterprising. So you see that, you see the informal economy, uh, the, the um, fact that people look after one another, um, and so on. So there are a lot of positive elements that you see coming out. And this government has also made it a top priority to try to figure out what to do about the internal violence. Part of the problem with the terrorist groups that are in Pakistan is not even so much that um, people actually like them, but they're afraid of them because they've been able to get ensconced. Uh, and that's the problem with the so-called TTP, the Pakistani Taliban, the group that really attacks institutions of the state and mosques and, and churches like in Peshawar recently. So everybody would like them to be gone, they just don't want the fight in their backyard. Um, and that has been a real problem for politicians because everybody wants them gone, but they don't, you know, if you want to fight, if you're from uh, the f northwest part of the country, you say, well, go fight the Taliban in Punjab. If you're in Punjab, you say, go fight them in, in, um, in Fatah, the tribal areas, or in the northwest. So this government is trying to get a consensus, uh, force everybody to the table to agree what to do. And they, they had a meeting, and of course what they agreed to do, not unexpectedly, and probably it's not going to work, but they said, let's, let's talk first. Let's try to talk to these people and see if we can talk at least some of them out of uh, their uh, struggle against the state. Um, and then we'll reserve the right to use force if we have to. Uh, we, we are skeptical that the talks will work, but it's not our affair. And at least they're trying to bring everybody together in a common understanding of, of, of what to do. And at least the, the government openly recognizes the link between the violence and the economy. You can't get the economy really going if you don't get a way forward on the violence. Um, and we also see that there are institutions, again, not associated with this particular government, but it's been going on for the last some years. The parliament is finally becoming a serious place. You have committees that hold the government to account. Uh, one of my favorite parts of the parliament is a women's caucus, very outspoken ladies introducing legislation and violence against women and acid attacks and all this kind of stuff. Um, and you have some very progressive legislation in that regard that got through under the PPP government, as a matter of fact. So there's, 
some serious um, activity going on there. You have a very active court. In fact, a lot of people think the court's too active, but in fact, it's very popular because the Supreme Court takes up a lot of cases that would normally just, people wouldn't see any justice. So there's a public face of justice. Sometimes, as I say, they overdo it, but um, they're active. You've got civil society. I mentioned philanthropy. Some of the schools, Citizens Foundation. There's another outfit called CARE, I Care that does schools. So lots of uh, activity going on. And you find a real um, desire for education among the Pakistanis. I know, um, you know there's an issue with girls' education, very obviously, with uh, Malala Yousafzai and all of that. Basically, people know intuitively that education is the way to a better future. And if they can possibly afford it, they send their kids to school. Now, you know, it, of course it happens sometimes that they're going to be working in the fields or they're going to be working at home. That uh, happens, but you can palpably see that the connection between being part of the mainstream and part of progress is connected to education. You can see that people really get that. Um, and you have a young population that is just very dynamic. Now, they could they can go in a positive direction, they can also go in a negative direction, but there's a dynamism and a potential demographic dividend there uh, that could be used in a, in a very positive way. And you find Pakistanis, young Pakistanis going back, you know, sort of the, the generation of the young people, children of some of you here in this room that are going back. Um, and creating a life there, finding um, you know opportunities in the business world, and and there off uh, thereby you know a, a, a place uh, which is uh, comfortable for them. So this is democracy beginning to work through civil society, through parliament, elections, and so on. And it's real, and it's palpable, and it's very, um, very, very positive. And you see better regional policies. Afghanistan, the new government has invited Karzai over in its first weeks. He came. They're talking very nicely to one another. A lot of work to be done, but it's turning another page. Similarly, with India, Prime Minister Sharif met with uh, Prime Minister Manmohan Singh in New York. Uh, and they're, they're turning over another page trying to find ways to work together. And we're responding. We invited Nawaz Sharif uh, for an official visit, all the bells and whistles, even though we were afraid we wouldn't be able to afford the honor guard because we were on, everybody was on furlough. <laughs> so it was the last minute <laughs> we managed to do it. And of course, it was too embarrassing to admit, well, we actually might not be able to pay for these soldiers. <laughs> But we did, we did, and they didn't know the <laughs> they didn't know the difference, and it was very, very, very nice, and everybody received him, and he was really working hard on um, on concentrating uh, on how to best explain what he was going to do different this time. So it was quite, quite impressive. Um, we have right now a energy working group going on in Washington D.C. Uh, talking about our energy cooperation, and uh, this group is going this afternoon off to Houston to meet with uh, the energy community in the United States to look for opportunities for investment. Uh, we have agreed to something Pakistan wanted very much. It sounds a little silly if you're not in the diplomatic business, but they wanted a strategic dialogue because this is a status thing when you're you know, in this state-to-state -state sphere. So we agreed to do that, to relaunch our strategic dialogue. We'll have a very formal, formal structured meeting between the two sides in the spring. Uh, and of course, the president will drop by and that'll make everybody happy. So it's, it's showing, it's an effort to show respect and to generally uh, engage on issues not only that we want, but also that they want, and from their side, not only what they want, but also what we want. So I think that's a good, very good sign. And I think we're, we're going to manage, if we continue to uh, um, 
you know, be responsible and thoughtful to really put some of the tensions that surrounded this last decade um, with the war in Afghanistan and all that went with that behind us. Um, and, you know, I said this morning, it's important for us to realize, and sometimes we don't, that Pakistan is a young country, 66 years, uh, you know, and half of it under military rule. So, in that, when you, you think of it that way, and it's the same with India, uh, made huge progress, huge, huge progress relative to that um, starting point and the disadvantages and, and exogenous variables that weren't of their making uh, that came along in the last 60 years. The potential for South Asia altogether, for Pakistan in particular, India's already demonstrated it. The economic potential is extraordinary. Uh, both because of the resources and because of the human resources. I mean, the, you know, these people in South Asia are really smart. You know, um, they figured out how to build nuclear weapons. Okay, now you can look on the internet today and figure that out. But in the times when they figured it out, you know, it was their scientists. Um, you know, people are smart, they're creative and thoughtful. There's huge potential. There's potential for U.S. investment. Uh, looking at the photographs that uh, we saw this morning, I'm reminded there's huge potential for tourism. Uh, this is one of the most extraordinarily beautiful parts of the world. The mountains, the sea, the desert, everything. Fabulous agricultural lands and science and technology exchanges and so on. So there's a lot to overcome for Pakistan and there's still uh, are issues to overcome in the relationship between Pakistan and the United States. But I think we're well on our way and with the help of groups like yours that really make an effort to understand other cultures um, and other societies like Pakistan that are really important to the United States in a foreign policy sense, I think we'll get there. Thank you very much for your attention. I've spoken too long, but I'm going to take some questions. Okay.